Hi, this is Pastor Jeff Snow from First Baptist Church here in Port Hope, Ontario. Welcome to my office once again, and uh, welcome to today's um, thought, sermon, message, devotional, whatever you want to call it. Um, I know I'm not, I don't usually dress up for our time together, and you may notice I'm always wearing a hat. Part of that is I want to represent the great Montreal sports teams that I've always enjoyed watching and cheering on. But um, before this whole isolation thing started, I was about due for my quarterly haircut. I don't like going to the barber. And call me weird, <laughs> but I don't. I'm not a great fan, so I put it off as long as I can. And the week that everything shut down, I was planning on going and getting my haircut. But right now, um, yeah, you don't want to, me to pick off my hat. It's very, very long, and I. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with it if this keeps going for longer. I may have to go the hippie look. I'm not sure. But for now, the hat stays on all the time. It's not meant as a sign of disrespect or anything. It's just to keep everything together up there on the outside anyway. Um, so yeah, just an explanation there. Today's a good Friday. Uh, if you're watching it on the day we post it for, you may be watching it later. But um, I want to share a few thoughts about uh, Good Friday. A number of years ago in Port Hope, well, actually in Ontario, in Toronto, um, Pope John Paul II came and held a massive, massive series of meetings in Toronto for World Youth Day. And um, all through southern Ontario that summer, the Catholic churches were doing all kinds of special events. And I was working with Youth for Christ then, and so they contacted me for some help and helping to secure some some music and some youth-oriented bands that they could hire to play for their events. One thing they did is they had this giant cross, maybe about, I don't know, eight or nine feet tall, that um, had come from the Vatican and had come to Canada, and they were having a procession all down Highway 2 with this cross. The young people and teens were, were kind of rolling this cross down Highway 2 and stopping in different towns and having different events. So the cross and the procession was stopping in Port Hope. And the Catholic priest at the time, Reverend John Albao, was a great fellow from the Philippines, and he worked really hard to include all the other churches in the stuff that he was doing. And so he invited all of his pastors to be part of the service when the cross came to Port Hope. And so we were all given an opportunity to take five or ten minutes of the service and, and share a word, a devotional word, and, and a piece of music, either from our choir or from a soloist from our church. And the topic that each one of us was given was the seven sayings of Jesus from the cross. Now, I knew that Jesus had said things from the cross. I just I realized there were actually seven of them and that they were very specific. And so each one of us kind of volunteered to speak on a different message on one of the seven sayings of Jesus from the cross. So today I want to share with you just briefly um, some ideas about the seven sayings of Jesus from the cross. Now, we talked last week, I think it was last week or two weeks ago, about the, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, how they'll often have the same story in them, but different details because they're all looking at it from different perspectives and different angles. And so, the sayings from the cross are different in, slightly different in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but if you put them all together, you end up with seven sayings. So we want to just quickly look at all seven of them, okay? So the first one's in Luke chapter 23, verse 34. When Jesus says, just after he's put up on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them, for we do not know what they are doing. Addressing the people in the crowd that were crucifying him. Now this grabs, this speaks to the essence of what's happening here. Forgiveness is the big picture of what's going on. Jesus is going to the cross to be able to offer forgiveness, not just to the people who are doing this to him, but to the broad world, to everywhere. Now it would be very easy for Jesus to show anger, uh, especially since he's being nailed to a cross for things that he didn't do. You ever get accused of something you've never done, and you know you've never done it? I mean, that's one of the things that really grates at me if I'm accused of something that I didn't do, or if something, or something good that I did is then accused of being a bad thing. 
um, I mean, I would get really angry. I might even want to seek revenge. But Jesus wasn't like that. There's an old Negro spiritual that uh, goes that Jesus could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set himself free. But he could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and for me. He could have put an end to that whole situation just like that. But instead, he showed mercy. He showed forgiveness. He showed grace. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. Grace is, mercy is, you stole 10 bucks from me. Um, it's okay. Give me, back, give, me back, give me back my 10 bucks. I won't press charges. You can go. That's mercy. Grace is, you stole 10 bucks from me. Well, you did that. You must really need the 10 bucks, and, and I want to help you out here. So you know what? I'm not going to press charges. Keep the 10 bucks, and look, here, here, here's another 10. That's grace. And God demonstrates that towards us, that he gives us far more than we could ever deserve, considering how we treat God sometimes, a lot of times. He gives us far more than we can deserve. Second saying of Jesus from the cross is in Luke 23, 43, and he says, Surely I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. Now he's speaking to someone very specific here. One of, there were two thieves nailed on crosses on either side of Jesus. And they each had a different approach to talking to Jesus and different ideas about what was going on there. And one of the thieves on, thief on the cross was angry. And was ranting and he's saying, Jesus, if you're who you say you are, then get us out of this mess. Just get us off the cross. You know, if you're really, you know, prove yourself. Prove yourself and make my life better by getting me off this cross. We often treat God that way. God, prove yourself. And do and the way I want you to prove yourself is make my life better. But the second thief scolded the first guy and said, how can you talk that way? I mean, we're guilty. <laughs> you and I are guilty as sin. This man hasn't done anything wrong. And so he turned to Jesus and he said, please remember me when you come into your kingdom. He didn't say, Jesus, can I come with you? Can I be in your kingdom with you? He knew what he had done and he knew what he deserved. And all he asked of Jesus was, will you remember me? The cross covers all of our sin. But we have to guard against the universalism that thinks, well, therefore, everybody is saved and everyone's going to heaven. The cross covers all of our sin, but it must be received. And Jesus died for the sin of that first thief, and the offer was there for him to receive it, but he couldn't see past his pain and his ranting and his anger in order to receive it. The second thief received it humbly. John 1.12 says, yet to all who receive him, Jesus, to all who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. This Good Friday, we remember, remember the gift of Christ's forgiveness, and that the gift of Christ's forgiveness is there for us to receive. But it's up to us to humble ourselves and receive it. The third saying on the cross is John 19.26. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that day onward, this disciple took her into his home. A couple of things about that passage. When, when Jesus says woman to his mother, that's not, don't look at that through 21st century eyes. It, it was not a term of disrespect. It was a term of respect in the first century. The second point is that John can write this story, and he's the only one of the four that writes this story and gives this, this account of what Jesus said. He can do that because he's the one that Jesus is talking to. He is the disciple that, that Jesus loved. He's the one that looked after Mary. And so we see here amidst all the pain and the agony that Jesus is going through, amidst this big picture of this, this big plan that this is the central point of history right now, this big plan of God reconciling the world to himself through the death of Jesus. Despite all that's going on, Jesus took a moment to look after his mom. And we need to know that we're never too busy, that we don't have time to look after our mom and our dad. 
and the people we love, and the people who look after us, and the people who need help, the vulnerable in society. We can never even be too busy in ministry for Christ. I think one of the saddest things we could ever say to God is that I can't help that person right now. I'm too busy working for you. Jesus gave us the example right here. In the middle of the most important thing God had called him to do, still took time out to look after probably the most vulnerable person in his life, his mom. Fourth saying of Jesus from the cross was, I thirst, John 19, 22, I thirst. Jesus was the only 200% man in history. He was 100% God and 100% human at the same time. He wasn't some spiritual schizophrenic where he was, sometimes he was God and sometimes he was human and kind of bounced back and forth between the two. He wasn't a 50-50 thing. He was fully God and he was fully human at the same time. And here in, on the cross, he's experiencing this spiritual agony, he's taking on all the sins of the world on his shoulders and on himself. And we'll talk about that in a second. But he also experienced physical agony, just like any human would. And in Hebrews chapter 4, we are told this. The writer says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest, talking about Jesus, who has ascended into heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who was unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Jesus knew exactly what it knows exactly what it means to be human. He's experienced everything that a human could. And so he understands, he empathizes with us, and he opened up the way so that we can approach God's throne with confidence, asking for mercy and asking for grace. We can come before God and pray and ask for his help. And he's good with that. And, um, and when we do go and ask God for help, I can't read my own hand right now. When we go and ask God for help, we will receive his mercy. Will receive his grace, will give us what we don't deserve to help us face whatever trial and difficulty and whatever stuff life throws at us. Jesus is 100% human, 100% God, and he knows, he empathizes, and he's here to help. The fifth saying of Jesus from the cross was, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew 27 46. Theologians have debated this for centuries, and I'm not going to solve it in the next three minutes. Um, one of the big problems people have with it is that how could God forsake Jesus if there's a trinity and, and God is always one, and that they're breaking up of the Godhead somehow, was, was God somehow separated? <coughs> and somehow we can't say that. Sorry. We can't say that somehow God was separated. Um, you may never understand it until heaven. But this is the one thing I think we can, we can say about this passage, this, this sentence from Jesus from the cross. Why have you forsaken me? Jesus bore the sins of the world on himself. <clears throat> Second Corinthians 5.21 says that God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus knew nothing of sin. He knew only the holiness of, of heaven. And yet he willingly became our sin. God in his holiness cannot be in the presence of sin. Because sin destroys what God loves the most. And that's me. And that's me. God loves us so much. And he doesn't, he's not angry at sin just because it's an arbitrary thing at him. No, it, he hasn't just decided arbitrarily, you know, well, hockey's a sin, or well, we that a sin, and we can't do that. No, he, he, things that God calls a sin are the things that he knows will hurt us. They're the things that he knows we weren't created for. They're the things that he knows will separate us from God, will draw us away from God, and, and so that, that thing becomes the foremost thing in our lives and in our minds instead, instead of God. So Jesus took on 
our sin. And, and I think in that moment, God has to turn away from Jesus. He's turned his back on him in a sense, in the sense that not because of, because of what Jesus represented at that moment, because of what Jesus actually was in that moment. In that moment, Jesus became all the wickedness of humanity, all the evil of humanity, everything that Hitler and Stalin and Chairman Mao and Caligula and all these evil leaders throughout the world, all the things that they did, all the things that you know unknown individuals have done to other people and to, to this world in evil and wicked ways. That was all put on to Jesus. And in that moment, God had to turn away. Jesus experienced the deepest agony that, that he could have experienced, that separation from everything he had ever known. Uh, he didn't cease to be God because if he had, he would not have been the perfect sacrifice for us. And that's a bit of a mystery there. He continued to be God, the perfect sacrifice, and yet he became all of humanity's evil and wickedness and sin. sin. He became sin for us, and the message of Good Friday is that he went through that for us. He experienced the, the death that sin brings so that we won't have to. The sixth thing of saying of Jesus from the cross, as we come to the end, is Luke 23, 46, where he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus had total trust in what God the Father was going to do, and total obedience to God the Father. He says in the garden, but just the night before this all happened, Lord, your will be done. I'm obeying you. In Philippians, we're told that Christ humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. He totally placed himself in God's hands and gives us a model of how we can trust and fully commit ourselves to a good God. And finally, Jesus said in John 19.30, it is finished. And I don't think he was just referring to his physical life at that point where he took his final breath and died. But it meant that the work that he had set out to do had been accomplished. It was done. We are told that as soon as Jesus said that and he died, that the temple veil was torn in two from the top to the bottom. Now, the, the veil in the temple was this thick, thick carpet. It's thick. It's it massive. And it... it separated the rest of the temple from the Holy of Holies. It separated all the people in the temple from the, the, the center of God's presence, where the priests could only go once a year and make sacrifice for the people. And um, But when Jesus died, the whole purpose for Jesus' coming was to reinstate our relationship with God, where there didn't have to be the separation, didn't have to be this, this sin wall that keeps us from knowing who God is and having a relationship with him. So the symbolism, the symbol of that was the temple veil. And it was torn, not from bottom to top, not something that a human did to try to reach God, but it was torn from top to bottom, where God reached down to us through Jesus and said, look, I've had enough of this, <laughs> us being separated. I'm doing this so that I can have a full relationship with, with my creation, with God. And with our, God with us. And now we can enter God's presence, have a relationship with him without the aid of a priest, without the aid of a rabbi, and have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. The way is open for us to know God. The way is open to know and understand why God created us. The way is open to understand God, what God's purpose for us is in this life. The way is open for us to know our creator and the one who loves us so much because it is finished. It's done. But it's up to us, like that thief on the cross, it's up to us to receive it. It's up to us to turn to Jesus and say, yeah, Jesus, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Like that thief on the cross said, I'm the guilty one. I'm sorry. I, I know that I've been wrong. And that's often what keeps many people from a relationship with God through Jesus Christ because the first step to it is to admit you're wrong. And we don't like doing that. And so um, humbling ourselves to admit that we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God is a big step, but it's a necessary step. So the first thing to be able to say to God is, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the things I've done that have hurt you, hurt myself, hurt other people. 
And the second piece to that is God take over. Uh, like Jesus, when he committed himself into God's hands, you need to say to God, okay, I commit my life into your hands. I turn myself over to you. Take over. I haven't done that great of a job of running my own life. You created me. You know how my life is supposed to go. So Lord, take over. And this Good Friday, if you want to have that relationship with God, if you want this Good Friday to mean what it was fully meant to mean in your life, if you want the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross to fully mean something more than just a celebration once a year, but to be the ongoing foundation of who you are in your life, it begins with praying a prayer. Something like that, something like this, God, I'm sorry. You know, I've done wrong things. And it's hard to admit, but it's right there in front of my face. I've done things that have hurt you, hurt others, hurt myself. I know that Jesus died on the cross so I can be forgiven of those things. I don't fully understand that, but it says in your word that Jesus became my sin. And so I accept that. I receive that. And because I'm receiving that, I know that I've become your child. And Lord, take over. Um, like a child to a parent, I, I need your help running my life. I, I not, don't know what's best for me. Well, some days, sometimes I think I do. But I need your help in order to put my life on track, in order to understand why it was I was created, what my purpose is. So Lord, please take over. Doesn't that be all those words? But in your own way, you want to say to God, I'm sorry. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. And, and take over. I commit myself into your hands, God. Then you've opened up the door to a whole new relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ. And his Holy Spirit comes to dwell inside of you. And will begin on a day-to-day -day basis to show you more and more who God is and to develop the character of Jesus Christ in you more and more so that you will follow him, be like him, and want to do the things that God has put you on this earth to do. So if that was your prayer, then this Good Friday will mean something more to you than ever. So thanks a lot for listening. Um, church office here in Port Hope is um, open most days. I'm usually here a lot of days isolating myself. The church is not open to the public, but I'm here. And if you want to call and let us know if maybe you prayed a prayer like that, or if you have any questions, um, you can call at 905-885-6021. That number is right here on your screen. Oh, yeah, sorry. We don't, we're not that high tech. 905-885-6021 if you want to get a hold of us here at First Baptist Church in Porto. And um, thanks for joining us. We will talk to you on Easter Sunday. God bless.